<laughs> Good evening. Welcome to Lesson 5. It seems like yesterday that we started. Lesson 5, uh, Creation and Science. Tonight we're looking at biological or macro evolution, the supposed change of one kind of animal to another kind of animal, a change in phylum, a change in major family as supposedly one type of animal over time is able to transition into another type of animal. So last week we looked at organical or chemical evolution, the supposed evolution of life. You see what's on tap for tonight, macro evolution. Next week, science laws in the Big Bang. So that's where we'll really wrap up the whole evolution topic on lesson six as we look at the laws that the Big Bang violates. So scientific laws the Big Bang violates. Lesson seven, six literal 24-hour days, question mark. That goes back to the creation account in Genesis. We'll look at that and see what the Bible says about creation. And then finally, the age of creation, part one. And that'll be a multi-part thing as we go through that. Working definitions, again, we'll continue to look at science. Asking tonight as we come to the end, is this scientific? Does this fit the definition of science? A new word, homology. And then finally, the last time we'll probably look at this word, evolution, because most of the time when someone says evolution, they mean the definition we're going to talk about tonight. So Webster's dis uh, definition of science, knowledge about the natural world that is based on facts learned through experiments and observation. Again, that's the key point of all of this. Facts, experiments, observation, real world, that's the point of science. Homology, a similarity often attributable, attributable to common origin. A likeness in structure between parts of different organisms, such as the wing of a bat and the human arm, due to evolutionary differentiation from a corresponding part in a common ancestor. So homology is the idea that the flipper of the whale is built just like your arm, thereby they came from common descent and a common ancestor. And we'll look at that tonight. And then finally evolution. We've looked at cosmic evolution. We've looked at the origin of stars, planets, galaxies. We've looked at chemical evolution, abiogenesis, and tonight finally macroevolution. And again, when you talk to people and they say they believe in evolution, this is normally the one they're talking about. Um, this includes monkey to man. This includes, let's be honest, molecule to man. So last week, just as a quick reminder, we talked about abiogenesis, the origin of life from non-living matter, specifically, according to Webster's, a theory in the evolution of early life on earth Organic molecules uh, and subsequent simple life forms first originated from inorganic substances. If you remember, we looked at, maybe, the 1953 experiment by Urey and Miller uh, at University of Chicago where they took what they believed was the early atmosphere, and again, this is according to evolutionists, and placed it within that chamber. There was a spark chamber. There was boiling water to create water vapor and move this around. And ultimately, in spite of everything they did, they created a few amino acids in left and right-handed form, which is absolutely the death knell because all of the amino acids in your body are left-handed. But they created a race mate. It was a mixture of both. A few molecules, but no complex biomolecules, what you find in life. So in life, you need all 20 amino acids. They created a few. In the simplest cell, you have over 400 molecules, over 400 complex proteins. They created none. In the human body, you have about 100,000. They're not even close. And so we walked through that last week. That is not how life could have originated. That is not science. In fact, that is non-scientific. And we said this, and I'll just review with you. Even if you could create all 20 amino acids required for organic life in the left-handed form through random processes, which you can't, and even if you could, from those amino acids, create the hundreds of complex molecules or hundreds of thousands, if we're talking about human life, needed for organic life, which you will not, and even if through random processes you could create a membrane that would wrap itself around all of these hundreds of molecules or even thousands that you just created, which is not going to happen. And even if through random processes you could create DNA and RNA to replicate the DNA, which who are we kidding? 
you are still missing the information for life. Even after all of that, and we've not got close to any of that. We said the simplest cell has 500,000 characters that must be properly coded for life. The human cell has 3 billion. That information never comes about through random chance and random process. But for the next 40 minutes, I need you to pretend with me that we can create life from non-living materials. Because that's where we need to be tonight. We have to start there or we don't even have a lesson tonight. So you need to pretend here we are. And you need to pretend that the massive amounts of information, even in the simplest cell, have come about by random processes. We have DNA and we have RNA or some type of other DNA replication system. So tonight, the supposed evidence for macro evolution. The first icon, and Jay, this was probably in the textbook that you reviewed. Um, it's in most high school textbooks. It's in most college biology textbooks. It's Heckel's embryos. Ernest Heckel, born 1834, died 1919. He was a German biologist and naturalist. He promoted and helped popularize Charles Darwin's work in Germany and developed the influential, at the time, recapitulation theory. That sounds cool. Let's see what it's about. Heckel claimed that vertebrate embryo, embryos passed through a series of similar stages in their early development and argued that this was a good, there was a reason for this. As the organism evolved, he reasoned, it did so by retracing the steps of its embryonic development. Now, you're probably thinking, I do not know what you said. So let me say it differently. According to Heckel's theory, as an organism passes through its embryonic development, it retraces its evolutionary process. So if it started out as a fish, and then it was a lizard, and then it was a bird, you could track all of that change in its embryos. That's the recapitulation theory. This idea became known as, and you can see it there, ontogeny recap, recapitulates phylogeny. Literally, development is a replay of ancestry. That's his theory. These are the drawings that are still found in many textbooks or drawings similar to these. His point is, the reason all of these look the same is because they all had a common ancestor and they started at that point. The reason some of these look the same according to him is because they're retracing a common ancestor. And only by the time they get here to the final stage do they finally get to what they've ultimately become. Now there's one problem you need to know up front about Heckel's drawings. They were forged. We know this now. Evolutionists admit it now. They were forged. They are forged drawings. So it's important to understand this idea of development as a replay of ancestry has been completely rejected, even though it appears Darwin did believe it, but I don't know of a single biologist today who believes it. So think about that. The theory's been rejected. The drawings have proven to be forgery. Even evolutionists admit that. So that would force a reasonable question for a thinking person, then why are they still in the textbooks today? The theory's been rejected. The dra drawings have been proven to be forgeries. Why would they still be there? In this next video clip from Icons of Evolution, a little discussion about these drawings. There's a school board member who's an evolutionist, and you'll see the discussions, and she explains, in her opinion, why they're still there. One article Roger DeHart wanted to show students was from the American Biology Teacher, the leading peer-reviewed journal for secondary school biology teachers. It was written by Jonathan Wells, a biologist with a Ph.D. in molecular and cell biology from the University of California at Berkeley. Wells is one of a growing number of scientists raising objections to Darwin's theory. In his article, Wells points out how many textbooks continue to use fraudulent drawings of embryos made by 19th century German Darwinist Ernst Haeckel. Ernst Haeckel was a, a German biologist and artist, a contemporary of uh, Darwin's who, uh, among other things, made some famous drawings of vertebrate embryos, uh, fish, humans, salamanders, chicks, turtles, and so on. And in those drawings, Heckel tried to show that all these different vertebrates look very much the same as early embryos. Their early similarities showed that they came from a common ancestor, and differences arose only later. 
problem is that he faked his drawings. The early vertebrate embryos don't really look that similar at all. The problem with Heckel's drawings wasn't just that they were inaccurate. They were actually false in many cases. Uh, but the real damage was done when these drawings entered into biology textbooks decades ago and they've never really been taken out. If you open a high school biology text now or even a college biology text, you'll find these drawings, although they may not refer to them as Heckel's drawings, in fact, they trace their ancestry directly to Heckel. See the pictures of the embryos. And it's what really damaged our understanding of, of development and our understanding of biology in general. It's clear that, that Haeckel may have fudged his drawings somewhat to look more like his ideal than they actually are. Now, does that actually take away from what we know about the relationship of embryology to evolution? Not a bit. The whole Haeckel's embryo story has been greatly blown out of significance. Uh, it is a minor footnote in the history of science. And actually, it's been known for 10 or 15 years that Haeckel's embryos are not to be relied upon. The reason why the diagrams are reproduced is because they're um, easily available. Uh, there's no copyright on them. It's a, an easy way to, uh, to illustrate a point. And I would argue that the basic point that's being illustrated by those drawings is still accurate. But if you go back earlier in development, the different classes of vertebrates look even more different. According to Wells, Haeckel, in many modern textbooks, misleads students not just because of fake drawings, but because they leave out the earliest stages of embryonic development. What students are shown as the first stage of embryonic development is actually the mid-stage. And very few textbooks show those earliest stages, and yet that's the whole point. It's the earliest stages that are supposed to be the most similar, and they're not. Some textbooks actually use photographs of embryos, but they pick only that stage and those classes that happen to look most similar. And they omit the earlier stages and they omit those classes that don't look similar. So that to me is uh, picking the evidence very carefully to support the theory, and that's not good science. Wells is a critic of Darwin's theory, but even staunch evolutionists like Harvard's Stephen Jay Gould have criticized the use of diagrams based on Hegel in textbooks. Stephen Jay Gould wrote an article for Natural History saying that we need to let go of, this, of these drawings, that uh, basically that they're not needed. So the reason the diagrams are reproduced, used today according to the school board leader, is because the point they are teaching is true. I would only respond, if I need falsified evidence to prove the point I'm teaching, it's probably because it's not true. So Heckel's embryos in review. First, the theory has been completely rejected, rejected, recapitulation. No biologist believes the theory. Number two, the drawings have been proven to be forgeries. Number three, similar in, in appearance does not prove common ancestry. That is ridiculous, even if they did look similar. And finally, I would just add, as you think about recapitulation and that whole idea, every single human embryo is able to properly navigate the trip to full human every time. Never misses a step, never takes an off-ramp. You know why? It's a human embryo. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Another icon of microevolution, or macroevolution, I'm sorry, I suspect Jay in the textbook you saw, was Charles Darwin's Tree of Life. Darwin, we're all familiar with him, 1809 to 1882, English naturalist and geologist, famous for his work, Origin of the Species, that is the short title. Darwin's Tree of Life first appeared in his notebook on transmutation of species. Now, I want to show you a couple of things so that you see it. Number one, this is his initial tree of life. Now, there's no species, there's no animals, it's just sticks. And he's got some letters. He's got a, an animal called A, B, C, D, or C, D, and 1, and then he has, I love this, up here, I think. Now, if you want to read the whole thing, that's what he's actually thinking about, but he's pontificating, he's pondering, he's thinking that they all start with a common ancestry, and they diverge over time. So these two little guys here would be very similar, but 
And the, uh, the one here and the one here would be very similar, but if you compared the one down here to the one up here, it would be very different. And that's what he's thinking. That's what the whole... This would ultimately find its way into origin of the species with a, a more polished diagram, but still no species attached, no animals attached to the drawing, just an idea. This is what the real tree of life looks like. Not like this little stick figure. If you're going to tie all this together, I want you to see the major families that you're going to have to tie together. You're going to have to tie together a starfish with a trilobite, with a crab, with a dragonfly, with an elephant, with a butterfly, with a kangaroo, and you've got to have all the information for that next phylum. So you've got a picture. You're going to have all types of mutations, all types of transitions between if you just follow any one of these branches and compare it to another one. Oh, and by the way, don't forget, you've got to have that self-replicating, loaded with information cell to ever get this imaginary tree of life started. Again, back to Darwin's uh, Icons of Evolution. In this case, it's Dr. Stephen Myers and Dr. Jonathan Wells as they discuss this idea of homologous structures. But there's another part of Darwin's theory that is also being challenged by some scientists. That's the claim that all living things are ultimately descended from a common ancestor. This claim underlies perhaps the biggest icon of evolution of all, the tree of life. The classical Darwinian picture of the history of life is that of a tree, that these small incremental changes build up and they branch out and so you start from very simple life and eventually you get everything that we have around us from elephants to alligators to chimpanzees and, and everything in between. Critics say that evidence used to support Darwin's tree of life is just as questionable as evidence used for the other icons of evolution. One major piece of evidence used to support the tree of life is homology. There is the front flipper, a hand built on the same model as my own hand. Biologists define homology as similarity in structure front between different flipper. organisms. Now this has the same design exactly as your arm. There's the upper My arm, textbook one bone. would show the forelimb, a hand, and it would show a bat's wing and a whale's flipper and say because they have similar structure, have similar bone pattern, that they must share a common ancestor. And then the five very long fingers, just like yours. The mere pattern of the bones doesn't tell you how it happened you have to supply a mechanism to explain how it got that way. Well, Darwin's mechanism, as understood by modern Darwinists, was genetic. You inherited similar genes, and these genes made the bones grow the way they do. The problem is that the evidence doesn't fit that explanation. According to modern Darwinism, if two structures are similar because of common ancestry, each structure should be produced by similar genes and go through a similar pattern of development in the embryo. But contrary to these predictions, biologists are learning that homologous structures can be produced by different genes and follow different patterns of development. For example, biologists consider the body segments of fruit flies and wasps as homologous. Darwinism predicts that these similarities should be due to the same gene, but in fact, different genes account for the development of body segments in these insects. This contradicts the idea that homology must point to common ancestry. In the same way, many body structures considered homologous by biologists develop in embryos in fundamentally different ways. One example is the gut in vertebrates. If the Darwinian theory were correct, the process by which the gut is constructed should itself be homologous. In fact, this isn't the case. We know, for instance, that in different vertebrates, the gut is constructed in very different ways during development. In sharks, the gut develops from cells in the roof of the embryonic cavity. In lampreys, the gut develops from cells on the floor of the embryonic cavity. And in frogs, the gut develops from cells in both the roof and the floor. So you have a homologous structure in vertebrates that is built in one way in a shark in one way in a lamprey, in another way in frogs, and you've got these very different developmental pathways converging to the same structure. 
This is very hard to reconcile with Darwinian common descent. These marine reptiles were built on much the same plan as you are. I would say in the past 20 years of studying this problem that biology is now entering what can only be described as a revolution because the evidence is so overwhelmingly against the conventional neo-Darwinian view. So it's impossible to have a homologous structure, forgive me, that's built on genetic, different genetic pathways. That overthrows the whole idea. That single point overthrows homology altogether. Now, up until every night if you've been here, I've allowed the experts to speak. I've had videos, and I didn't do that tonight. I sort of just ran and left them behind, but I think it's important to give them a voice. Derek was laughing at one of their voices earlier, so I thought we owed it for them to explain what they believe. Um, tonight, coming from Evolution versus God, we're going to allow some scientists, some Ph.D. faculty members, as well as students, give examples of macroevolution. Can you think of any observable evidence for Darwinian evolution where he said there'd be a oh change of kinds? A monkey to a man, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, a change of kinds. I don't really believe there's any proof for that yet. Wild monkeys are the only ones with the fifth digit, like we have. Well, koalas have a fifth digit. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Think we're evolved from koalas? No. When I went to, like, Washington, D.C., I saw the, they had a whole exhibit just on the... In the Smithsonian? Yeah, in the Smithsonian. Oh, wait, so that is just like some stuffed dummies, yeah, like standing around a fire. I know that everyone talks about the missing link for humans and whatnot. I believe that there are connections that are out there that we haven't found yet. I'm going to trust what those experts did, those experts uh, came up with. I have a strong trust in evolutionary ideas based on the evidence presented. Can you think of any observable evidence for Darwinian evolution, a change of kinds? I haven't seen it myself, but I believe what the textbooks tell me about it, so... You've got faith in the experts? I have faith in the experts, yeah. I guess similar to how religious people have faith that God actually exists, I have faith in the experts knowing what they're talking about. The scientific method is, must be observable and repeatable, so could you give me one piece of observable evidence for Darwinian evolution? Okay, I would point to, as one great example is, look at the genetics of the stickleback. What's that? Uh, so stickleback fish are a very interesting collection of species that were recently isolated after the end of the Ice Age. What have they become? They're, they're various species of sticklebacks. They stayed as fish? Well, of course. Can you think of any observable evidence where there was a change of kinds? Fish. Human beings are still fish. Human beings are fish? Why, yes, of course they are. How long did that take? A couple of billions of years, millions. A couple of millions? How is that observable? It's not. We came out of the ground as a mammal, and one mammal created... Come out of the ground? Didn't we come out of the sea? Huh? Well, initially in the beginning, we came out of the ground and the sea after the great destruction of the... the... So do we have lungs or gills when we came out of the sea? You want to know something? Those that were in the sea, I guess, had gills, and those that were on land had lungs. But if we came out of the sea, we had you gills in the sea. You want to know something? Who knows that we came out of the sea or we came out, we evolved from mammals? So you don't know? Huh? Of course I don't know. I'm accepting that they did their science correctly. Do you give me an example of Darwinian evolution, not adaptation or speciation, but a change of kinds? <laughs> These are changes of kinds. They're still fish. They're distinctly different fish. We have thousands of examples. Give me, can say, you give me one? I can give you, I can give you thousands, just one. For instance, I would say, uh, look at Lenski's experiments with bacteria then. So what do the bacteria become? The bacteria are still bacteria, of course. So that's not Darwinian evolution. That's not a change of kinds, is it? It, it is a change, it is a change in the genetic makeup of the bacteria, which but is still kind. bacteria. So what do the bacteria become? Uh, a new kind of bacteria. So it's still bacteria, there's no change of kinds. To summarize, the observable evidence that you give me for Darwinian evolution is bacteria becoming bacteria. No, it is bacteria acquiring new metabolic capabilities. You said before that there, are, there is lots of evidence for evolution. I just want one observable evidence for Darwinian evolution, yeah, no, just one. But I gave you some, you don't want... Not some, I want one. Oh, wait, you don't want that. I want one. Yes, well. I do, I'm pleading no, with you people. Said, you asked me to tell you, you asked me to tell you when I've watched one species evolve into another, isn't that right? 
you know, one kind into another. There's 14, is it 14 different definitions of species. So I want a change of kind. When you're talking about kinds or change in families, you're, you're actually talking about, about macro evolution. You're talking about um, uh, changes on the level of, that separate, say, cats from dogs. So could you give me any examples of Darwinian evolution? Well, uh, when you say examples of that, then you have to sort of look at over a longer time. Okay. Now, wait a minute. These are not stupid people. Five of the individuals you saw tonight have PhDs. So I'll go back to the question, where is the evidence for macroevolution? So I, can, I say, okay, let's give them one more chance. You say change of kinds, you mean the evolution of one species from another to another. Yes, we have that in action, actually, in the Galapagos. Could you give me one instance? Yes, we have an example from a group of birds called Darwin's finches. You take a look at the difference between the finches on the islands that all started out. I mean, that's very, very observed. But that's not Darwinian evolution. There's been no change of kinds. What did the finches become? They become genetically new and anatomically new, recognizably different species. So they're still finches? Well, of course, there's still finches. Yeah, there's not a change. Of, there's no change of kind. Little birds that he uh, that he had observed. That oh, what did they become? Um, their beaks, their beak shapes. They're their still color. birds. Yes, three finches that turn into different types of birds. Based they're on still the finches. Species. Well, for example, Darwin and and his study on evolution of the birds on the island that he went on to there. Their beaks changed. Their beaks. Uh, but they're still birds. There's no change of kinds. That's within no, no, no. the kind. It's evolution on the beak. That's so that's called adaptation. It's not Darwinian evolution. There's no change of kinds. There's no different animal involved. I want something that shows me Darwin's belief in a change of kinds is scientific. Darwin spoke of a change of kind. Can you think of any observable evidence for Darwinian evolution where there's a change of kind? Uh, <laughs> change of kind. Change of kind. Uh, I'm going to have to think about that one a little longer. You give me anything that I can see, observe, and test, which is a scientific method for Darwinian evolution, a change of kinds. Test and observe. Could you give me observable evidence, which is a scientific method for Darwinian evolution, a change of kinds? about it <laughs> um, so you want the evidence of it I would say I cannot I think Hard question, actually. Mitochondrial DNA. Uh, so, can you repeat the question again? Could you give me any observable evidence, just one, for Darwinian evolution? Yeah, let me think about that for a sec. Um, hmm. okay. Observable evidence, something where we don't have to exercise faith. Something that can be observed, like the scientific process, observable? Hmm, that's a good question. That one I'm not quite sure. So you can't think of any observable evidence for evolution? No. How do you know it's true? Hmm. I'm not sure. So Darwinian evolution is not observable, it's not scientific? I guess so. So it's unscientific, you can't prove it. It's scientific, actually. You could prove it. It could be proven, just do it for me. Ah, that's hard. I don't got, I don't, it's just, that's just too broad of a... Of it's unobservable. That's why you need millions of years. Yes, exactly. Where? You're trusting the biology majors and the biology professors know what they're talking about. Yeah. And, and they can't even give me, a, they can't even give me evidence of a change of kinds. Well, I'm, well, then there isn't one. If they don't give it, then I don't, I wouldn't say there was. Yeah. I just go on what I've seen and what I've learned from class. So you believe? Yeah. You know what that's called? What? Blind faith. Blind faith. <laughs> Faith is the great cop-out, the great excuse to evade the need to think and evaluate evidence. Richard Dawkins.
Now, Richard Dawkins made that statement against Christians. But for the young people in the room, I want you to see it took just one question to unravel PhDs. And that's, can you give me an example? So, other evidence for macroevolution, if we were to try to, oh, my clicker died. Many point today to Darwin's research on the Galapagos Islands. They point to winged fruit flies. They point to antibiotic resistant bacteria as other examples of macroevolution. So I thought we should deal with those quickly as well. Critics of Darwin's theory say that finch beaks provide a good example of microevolution, small changes within a species or gene pool. But it does not by itself provide evidence for macroevolution, which is the origin of fundamentally new organisms and body plans. When we look at dogs, no matter how far back we go, it's dogs. When we look at bacteria, no matter what we do, they stay bugs. They don't change in their fundamental nature. There seems to be some sort of an inherent species limitation, and we have no good explanation for this in terms of Darwinian theory. We should have far more flexibility, far more plasticity under laboratory conditions than we actually do if Darwinian theory or anything like that were correct. According to critics of Darwin's theory, the problems facing macroevolution can be clearly seen in yet a third icon of evolution, the four-winged fruit fly. In opening a biology text, um, one will often see a picture of a four-winged fruit fly. Now, as we know, ordinary fruit flies have only two wings. The four-winged fruit fly has not only its regular set of wings, but a second set of wings just next to that. And the caption or the text will say, this is evidence for um, the process of evolution, that mutations affect the process of development and you can get anomalies as interesting as a four-winged fruit fly. Well, it turns out that the four-winged fruit fly is actually a very poor example of Darwinian evolution, certainly. There are no muscles attached to it, so the second set of wings is effectively dead. Uh, the fly is a hopeless cripple. It's kind of like having a small plane with an extra pair of wings tied to its tail. The fly can only survive in the laboratory, uh, and it would be selected out by natural selection in the wild. So it's not uh, a step forward in evolution. It's an evolutionary dead end. Modern Darwinian theory, known as Neo-Darwinism, is based on the idea that randomly occurring mutations in genes provide the raw material needed for evolution to work. The idea that mutations are considered the engines of evolution has only one problem. There's no evidence to support it. So if you think about changes in the genetic code, can you think of any changes that would be beneficial or helpful to organisms? Almost all mutations are deleterious. Almost all of them do the organism absolutely no good. In fact, we have a devilishly hard time finding any mutations that do the organism any good whatsoever. These organisms only really survive in the laboratory. No other fruit fly will mate with them. These are not promising avenues for macroevolution. They're in fact dead ends for evolution because these mutations cannot be passed on by ordinary reproduction. It's almost as if the fruit fly says, if you want me to exist at all, I better have two eyes, six legs, two wings, and so on. I better have more or less the normal form. Modern Darwinists contend that there are some cases where mutations do promote evolution. Their chief example could be considered another icon of evolution, antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Antibiotic resistance, in terms of natural selection, is an excellent example. And it's used. I mean, it's one of the, one of the um, hallmark examples given in, in microevolution for support of Darwinian thought. However, I think in the, in the last few years, it's got to be reinterpreted to a degree. Laboratory research shows that when an antibiotic is applied to literally billions of bacteria cells in a petri dish, a few mutated cells that happen to be resistant to that drug remain. Those few cells can then give rise to a colony of resistant bacteria. The question is, how well does this mutant strain survive in the long run? It can be measured in what scientists call fitness cost. How well does this mutant bacteria survive when the drug is removed and it now must compete with the original parent bacteria? These organisms are not able to grow 
with the fidelity, the robustness that the original parent did. And that's one of the things that we've been looking at. So you can take a culture of cells that are, that are sensitive to the drug, plate them out on petri dishes that have the drug, but there's a single colony coming up that's resistant to the drug. One cell that gave rise to this colony was resistant to the drug out of four billion. If this is the parental strain, we now have a mutant, we grow them up separately, and then we put them in the same test tube without the drug. So now we've removed selection and we can measure empirically the fitness cost in terms of how well the resistant organism can now compete with its parent. The surprising result is that in a relatively short period of time, the resistant bacteria lose out in their competition with the parent. They can't reproduce as fast and over a short time disappear. Within one or two transfers of overnights, you can lose that population of resistant cells. And then after the third transfer, the resistant isolate has been completely outcompeted by the parent. It turns out that the resistant strain has a defect in its information processing system. The cell's crippled and there's a limit to how much change can occur. When the resistance strain comes into contact with a parental wild type in nature, the parental wild type will reestablish dominance in the population, resulting in no net evolutionary change. We're going backwards in terms of the fitness of these organisms, not forwards, is used as an example of evolution. So the problems. In all of these examples, one thing should catch your attention. There's no new information. There's damage to information, there's mutations, but there's no new information. There's no cell, be there's no bacteria becoming something new. Equally, these mutated cells as they explain, their information system is damaged. They can't compete with their parent cells when put back in the same environment. They're an injured species, but there's no information, there's no evolution. There are a few mutations that may in some way help an organism, but this is not the road. This is not the magic required for natural selection to convert one animal form into another. But there's a more serious problem. And this is much more serious to macroevolution. This is from the clip, uh, Evolution's Achilles Heels. Well, one of the most intractable problems in paleontology is one of Darwin's own devising. When Darwin wrote The Origin of Species, he knew of a group of fossils low in the geological column called the Cambrian. Since Darwin believed that all animals shared common ancestors, he believed that the animals in the Cambrian must therefore have ancestors in the rocks below them. To put the Cambrian explosion in context, let's think of Earth history like a football field. On an old age system, the beginning of the Earth at one end zone is four and a half billion years ago, and the present is at the other end zone. The Cambrian starts all the way across the field at the opposing team's 12 yard line and extends for one full yard. The Cambrian explosion though, where we see the first appearance of all of these different animal body plants, these phylum level divisions, happens in just four inches. It's not even the whole yard. So in the four inches that is the Cambrian explosion, this, this narrow slice of time in geology, we have the first appearance of animals that are as different from each other as mollusks and clamshells from jellyfish. These are huge anatomical differences that are supposed to happen in a window of time where in other areas you're arguing about whether or not uh, humans and gorillas shared a common ancestor. A small difference anatomically compared to the huge body level uh, divisions that we see first appear in the Cambrian. But you know, there are no precursors to the Cambrian fauna in the pre-Cambrian rocks. The pre-Cambrian supposedly represents a couple of billion years of history, yet it shows nothing more than blue-green algae and bacteria, maybe a few other things thrown in late in the pre-Cambrian. So one thing we hear a lot is that maybe the ancestors of the Cambrian fauna were, were soft bodies, so they didn't leave any remains behind to be fossilized. And Darwin in The Origin of Species, he said, no organism wholly soft can be preserved. But that is nonsense, for even he knew fossil sand ripples and even raindrops were preserved in the rocks. And today, we have fossils of jellyfish, of worms, right from the fossil record. 
While the Cambrian explosion stands as strong evidence against evolutionary predictions, it's actually exactly what creationists would expect out of the fossil record. If Noah's flood created the bulk of our fossils and sedimentary rocks, then we would expect that as the flood starts in the ocean and drives its way on towards the continents, that it would pick up these marine ecosystems, burying them in sediment and driving them up onto the land where they would become fossilized and become sedimentary rocks. The thing about the Cambrian explosion that's so interesting is that when we look and see in those first four inches, all these different animal phyla appear, it's a complex and complete ecosystem. This isn't a single organism that shows up and then later on another organism and then later another. It's an entire suite of organisms that were in one place, were catastrophically buried, and their remains were driven onto the continents. The basic features of the fossil record, sudden appearance. There's an absence of transitions leading to the first appearance of a particular kind of animal. And the other feature is that fossils basically stay the same within their kinds. There might be some variations, but they're small compared with what is uh, to be anticipated if evolution from uh, amoebas to people happened. Evolutionists argue that the fossil record is incomplete, but this is no longer an adequate answer to this because we have millions of fossils that have been found. And the more fossils we find, the more clear it is that the transitions are missing. So, the Cambrian explosion is the exact opposite of what Darwin's theory predicted. Darwin's I think has been overthrown by real observable geological paleontological information. In the Cambrian is the sudden appearance of most of the phylum we have on this planet, the major animal forms, all in one moment. And this is exactly what we would expect if the Bible is true. The Cambrian explosion creates, I said, a real dilemma. It is really the death nail of neo-Darwinism, of macroevolution. So the science, geology, paleontology, biology do not support the idea of transition in animal form from one form to another. And once again, science points to intelligent design, although Darwin may have thought or imagined otherwise. Charles. And so we'll skip this. Um, back to his tree of life. I'll just sort of wrap all this together. This cannot happen. The forms, as we saw in the Cambrian, appear suddenly. Mutations do not create new information. The real tree doesn't look anything like this imagined tree, and there are no transitional forms. Now, when I say that, we'll have a whole topic on fossils and transitional forms. But here's what's important. If animals were transitioning from one type of animal to another, think of what it would look like right now on this planet. This would be an ongoing experiment in every animal species, both successful mutations and unsuccessful mutations. It isn't like it's only happened in the past. It would still be happening today. We wouldn't need to go to the fossil record to see if your cat became a cow. We would see it happening right in front of us, and it's not. Because as one of those scientists said, there seems to be this rigidness about the kinds of animals and that they lack this plasticity, to use his word, that we would expect, especially in a lab setting. And there's the real tree of life. What's interesting is every dog we find, science believes, traces back to a dog. Shocking, I know. So where's the transition? We do not find transitional fossils. We'll talk more about that in an upcoming lecture. We don't find transitional animals with us, and it should be happening now if it ever happened. But I also want to show you a few things you're not going to see. I'm sure of it. First, one thing I don't think you're going to see is this. Regardless of what Darwinian theory may predict, I don't think you're going to see this. I have another example. I don't think you're going to see one of those. And you know what? Even though the beak size may change, I don't think you're going to see one of those. Okay, so let me give you God's version of the story real quick. Three points I want to make tonight, and I'm done. Um, going to day five, Genesis 1.21, God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures. Can you imagine what that looked like? As here was this planet covered by water, and in an instant, the waters abounded 
with living creatures? I can't imagine. Was it a swirl, Pastor Doug? I don't know, but what did it look like when God said, let the waters abound with an abundance? That's how he describes what happened. Let the birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures, every living thing that moves, with which the waters abounded according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. Obviously, two points real quick here. Obviously, the text is clear. God created everything. Amen. He created the birds. He created the sea animals. He creates the mammals. He creates man. But notice also, He created them after their kind. That, that lack of elasticity, those barriers that we don't seem to be able to break through, the reason that your cat is never going to impregnate your dog, the reason if you take the cat sperm and bring it to the dog egg, it will not impregnate the egg, is because that's how God designed it. And we have a hint of it right here in Genesis. So enough evidence. At this point, I do not believe it's a matter of producing more evidence. We've looked at cosmic evolution. It could not have happened. We've looked at planetary and stellar evolution. Even if the Big Bang did happen, you will never get stars to form. We've looked at chemical evolution, the supposed evolution of life. Not going to happen, and then tonight, macroevolution, changes in kind. The information alone is the death knell. Um, it just will not happen. All of these things are unscientific. But you know, the Bible describes why men believe these things. So let me show you. This is Paul writing to the church in Rome in Romans 1.20, and he says this, For since... The creation of the world, His, that's God's, invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Did you see what that says? The creation is declaring His eternal power and Godhead. When men look into the cosmos, they have the declaration that there is an all-powerful God and they are suppressing that truth. They are holding that truth down. When men look into the intricacy of the cell, the glory of God and the eternal power of God is being declared and men are suppressing, willfully suppressing that truth. But look what Paul says. Oh no, no this truth will never bring you to salvation. You need the revealed Word of God to tell you about Jesus Christ to bring you there. But this truth will leave every man and woman on this planet, every man and woman in this room tonight, without excuse Amen. on Judgment Day. That's right. Because the declaration of God's eternal power and His Godhead has been clearly revealed in the creation. Thank you.